Spoilers ahead for Justice League Infinity number two, the newest issue of the Justice League Unlimited continuation comic from JLU alumni James Tucker, JMD Mateus, and Ethan Beavers. If you haven't read the issue yet, go get yourself a copy on Comixology or your local comic book store. And pick up issues of the new Milestone Returns comics while you're at it. SUPPORT STUFF! Justice League Infinity is a wild ride so far. We cannot say enough good things about it, but today we're going to be focusing on all of the easter eggs and trivia in the new issue. Everything from callbacks to the original cartoon, to comic book references, to how this all fits in the increasingly massive DC Animated Universe timeline. Really quick before we get started though, I should mention that the next issue of the other DCAU comic coming out right now, Batman The Adventures Continue, got delayed a week this time around, so our coverage of that will also be coming out a week from now. That's how time works. And we've got a new podcast going. I'm showing my friend Brian the entire DCAU one episode at a time. He's never seen any of it before. New episodes of Jump on the Batwagon premiere every Friday on our second channel, The Pod Tower, and also on Spotify and a few others that are the the robots are working on pushing it to the places. It'll be it'll be on iTunes and Google and all that stuff pretty soon. Get it? Got it? Good. Correction speedrun. Stuff we messed up last time. This is the part where we feature your comments from last issue's breakdown video, if you legit called us out on a mistake or something we missed. And this time we've got audience submissions from Ashley Tuchin, Tuchin, I don't know, sorry, who points out that at the end of JLI number one during the dinner date, Superman emphasizes the words reverse and polarities, which may be a subtle reference to the catchphrase of the third doctor from Doctor Who. I never would have known. The full phrasing, reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. Reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. Which has been suggested in universe to be nothing but meaningless techno babble. I'm told. And thanks to our old buddy Kristoff, who used to run our sort of sister site, The Metro Tower, back when JLU was still on the air and we were all children, we found out the title of this two-part story, The Cracked Mirror, is based on the name of a John Bernhelm Superman story in The Man of Steel number 5, December 1985, inversely titled The Mirror Cracked. Nearly 20 years later, everyone's favorite human, Jeff Loeb, would reuse that title for his and Ed McGuinness's Superman number 181. And lastly, Ted wanted me to throw in that he wished he had thought to compare the interdimensional gateway door thing that Amazo goes through with the door to the Red Room from Twin Peaks, especially now with this issue's reveal of the name The Mirrored Room. If you catch something we miss in this new issue, leave us a comment below to feed that hungry, hungry algorithm beast. Now, on to DCAU references. Right from page Page one, we get shards depicting bona fide moments straight from episodes of Justice League Unlimited, The Return, and Wake the Dead. The last being Amazo retreating to deep space to ponder a way to defeat Solomon Grundy. That was the last time we ever saw Amazo in the animated series, with a little over two seasons of amazo list episodes following. Though I've never seen this outright stated anywhere, or at least I don't remember where if I did, I've always assumed the writers used this Grundy incident as a means to take Amazo off the game board, as he was too overpowered to allow further threats to seem threatening. Which reminds me, we've got a whole video breaking down all of Amazo's powers, so watch that when you're done with this video. You have homework now. And the following panel, showing Amazo standing alone on a floating rock in space, ironically goes pretty hand in hand with a gag post Bruce Tim made on the Toon Zone message boards back in December 2004, like right after Wake the Dead aired. Several episodes from now, the JLU are fighting yet another Omega-level menace. Heroes are dropping like flies. Jean sends in the reserves, but it's a no-go. Even Shira's magic deus Ex Masona is useless. Earth is doomed. Smash cut to the far reaches of space. A lonely golden figure sits on a floating asteroid. Hmm. I wonder if they've gotten rid of Grundy yet. Either that or this is the rock that Killer Croc threw. It was a big rock. Credit to the DCAU Review podcast for that one. I'm not that funny. On this page, Amazo is also credited as the creation of Professor Arthur Ivo, which is a good catch on the part of Tucker and DiMatteis to keep the first name of the DCAU version of the character, as he's named Anthony Ivo in almost every other one of his appearances in DC media. Page two gives us more shards, including a look at Darkseid in his same basic design from Justice League and Superman the animated series, as far as we can tell, and who is set to appear in the fourth issue of this comic series, as well as Wonder Woman of the Justice Lords, or as was the nomenclature of Earth-12 comics, Lady Wonder Woman. There's one more sneaky cameo in here, but I'm gonna save that for Ted's segment. Superman is so shocked to have been swapped into Overman's universe that he turned into his Static Shock character model. <coughs> Go by Milestone Returns comics. But really, he also looked like this in issue number one. It's the whites of the eyes and the black trunks that are making me say this hilarious 
this joke here in the video. See, I, I'm not as funny as DCAU Review. But if this and this can be the same suit, Superman can do it too. Overman's symbol is noted by Lois Lane, with help from the editor's note, to be the same as that of the Superman from Brave New Metropolis, as I guessed last video, just saying. And as we'll see soon, it's also very close to the S Vandal Savage symbol, which is a really fun parallel. And by fun, I mean gross, because they're both very clearly inspired by the icon of the Nazi paramilitary organization, the Schutzstaffel, more commonly known as the SS. What's the S stand for? Schutzstaffel. More Brave New Metropolis comparisons can be drawn from the death of Lois Lane, which we see a version of here in a much more blatant depiction that definitely couldn't have been shown on Kids WB back in the day. Ooh, this Lois about to become Nazi Scarecrow. John Jones is referred to as the Martian Manhunter again, this time via Superman's narration, which if you'll recall from our last video, was only uttered once in the cartoon by the Clock King in Task Force X. John's also apparently faster than Lex Luthor's plan- Oh, wait, no, sorry. Different airline. In that case, he's much faster! Elongated man stretched out all over the ground in battle reminds me of this shot from the opening of the JLU episode Clash. And when we cut back to the League a few pages later, we do get Shiera in costume as promised. As Superman battles Brainiac on Overman's world, he calls back to the episode where he and the League time traveled and fought Vandal Savage back in World War II, which the editor's note also met. Oh, let me just, uh. <laughs> There we go. Vandal Savage himself is looking like he's ripped right out of the Savage time, though now sporting an overcoat as well, like we might have seen on Adolf Hitler. The real one, not Popsicle Hitler. There's another Savage Time parallel, as Superman is pulled through a vortex and stretches a bit, sort of like what we saw in that episode as the heroes were pulled through time. And the act of a Justice Leaguer being teleported out of a deadly situation and into the underground lair of the Resistance is beat for beat the same as what happened to Green Lantern in the episode Hearts and Minds. Either that or Superman is being pulled into the Serververse. Is that a basketball I see? LeBron James and Bugs Bunny. The freedom fighters he meets here, we'll bring back up in a minute, but their version of Doomsday, Free Doomsday, has some pretty similar aesthetics to Ty Templeton's spicy clay face design for The Adventures Continue. More like Doom's Clay, am I right? For better jokes, tune in every Saturday for new episodes of the DCAU Review on the Pod Tower YouTube channel. And lastly, for DCAU references, we get a look at Overman's origin story through psychic flashbacks, which, by the way, is a super cool way to visualize Jean's telepathy. Just had to mention that. Here we get a very similar, but not quite the same, same rocket blasting away from an erupting Krypton, complete with what may be moons, but may also be this universe's Argo and some other planet. Is there another Krypton adjacent planet in the comics? I don't know things, but whew, there is a lot more to cover from this issue. So let's tap into the TED feed and go over all of the comic book references. Comic book references from a comic book? The concept for this segment still amazes me. Speaking of amazing, let's return to Amazo on page two with all those mirror room shards behind him. Calvin Ellis' Superman is in the mid left, in a similar pose to the cover of Action Comics Volume 2, Number 9 by Gene Haw in July 2012, which itself is close in design to Bruce Timm's Superman They Made series inspired variant cover for Adventures of Superman Number 4 in August 2013. We can expect President Superman to properly appear later in the series, since he is on the cover for issue number three alongside Nubia, the Wonder Woman from his world, typically Earth-23 in the mainstream DC multiverse. General Abraham Zadesta, aka Zod from Overman's universe, is drawn to look like the original Silver Age version of Drew Zod, who first appeared in Adventure Comics number 283 in April 1961. Superman's caption narration suggests he encountered Zod before in the DCAU, who we've only ever seen in Superman Adventures number 21 and the Justice League Unlimited number 34 comic. JLU episode for The Man Who Has Everything also had a quick mention where Luana shares that little Zod is having a birthday party. Overman's universe also has a version of the Freedom Fighters, which include a version of Doomsday and Metallo, who don't seem to be based on any other comic book versions. Metallo may be an extension of the cyborg girl idea from the Justice League pilot footage, though that's kind of a stretch. I think it is more likely Natasha Irons, the niece of John Henry Irons, aka the Justice League Steel, both of whom interacted with Metallo in Superman the Anime Series episode Heavy Metal, so maybe they're connected here as well. However, this begs the question of how a kryptonite-powered individual like Metallo can even work in a universe 
universe where Kryptonite doesn't seem to affect Superman. When Jean taps into Overman's mind, we see that Kryptonite does exist when Krypton explodes, but Overman isn't affected by it, or even aware what it is, when Lois shoots him with a K-Ray gun or whatever. Maybe the rock just wasn't called Kryptonite on Overman's world, especially if Savage kept its existence a secret, or neither of them ever learned of Krypton's demise to label it as Krypton Knight. I nearly thought for a sec that Overman was going to turn around to be powered up by it, sort of like Ultraman from Earth 3 snorting Kryptonite to get his powers in the Forever Evil comic. I'm hoping we see some other presumably Earth 10 people like Leatherwing the Nazi Batman, or if Batman is part of the Resistance like the alternate future from the Savage Time. Maybe they will be integrated into the Freedom Fighters now, which is an obvious reference to the DC team of the same name, who fought Overman on Earth 10, or traditionally Earth X, though typically led by Uncle Sam with teammates the Ray, Black Condor, Phantom Lady, Human Bomb, and Dollman. That version of the team appeared in Justice League Unlimited number 17, but as part of the regular animated universe, rather than some place in the multiverse. Brainiac Enslaved by Overman is pretty similar to how Brainiac was controlled by Ultraman in Grant Morrison's JLA Earth 2 graphic novel, as well as the Brainiac Superman dynamic in Superman Red Sun. Fascist versions of Superman usually make Brainiac work for him. The concept of baby Kal-El landing somewhere else is also comparative between Overman and Superman from the Red Sun universe, as well as the character in the Justice League Gods and Monsters movie, Flashpoint, and plenty of other instances. It's a trope now. Overman uses the word crisis to describe the multiversal shenanigans, which is very on the nose but in a good way. There's also a splash page with the Justice League fight Overman near a wrecked red car, which looks like an inverse of the cover for Action Comics number one, where Superman famously lifts that classic green automobile. Red is the opposite of green, you know. Look at a color wheel. Just, I don't know. The word aberrance is also used multiple times, which literally means someone who's not where they're supposed to be. The biggest reference to DC Comics might be the Aberrant Six from 2009's Strange Adventures by Jim Starlin, which included folks like Bizarro and Adam Strange, who were displaced by cosmic events. Their survival was at odds with what the universe apparently desired, but they survived by some presumably editorial reasons? It was a weird storyline, but I liked it. Next up in JLI number three is War of the Supermen, which was also a miniseries that ran from June and July 2010, which spun out of James Robinson's new Krypton arc from his Superman run. Now, I'm gonna hot potato this thing back over to James. Tuber. And of course, what Watchtower Database video would be complete without some timeline stuff? Before we jump into any of the timeline stuff, I've obviously gotta talk about Jean again. While issue number two had them returning to the role of the Martian Manhunter, DeMatteis and Tucker are really steering into the genderqueer aspect of the character, which is super appreciated given that non-binary representation in nerd media is so slim, and the subset of that that reflects gender fluidity is even smaller. There were some comments last time suggesting I was reading into things here, but it honestly is that simple. Jean sometimes identifies as female, we see that here with Amrit Jessawala, and other times as male. That's literally what gender fluidity is. But enough about gender politics, let's talk about politics politics. We get a pseudo timeline break when Superman states he thought he had been transported across the US rather than across the multiverse, since, quote, low some gatherings like these were becoming more and more common in my adopted country, with literal Nazis clashing with anti-fascist protesters. While white supremacists and explicitly Nazi rallies are nothing new in the US, the mention of them on the rise makes it pretty clear that this is a commentary on modern times. But a left-leaning analysis of the political landscape is nothing new to the DCAU, and in fact goes all the way back to Batman the Animated Series. Remember, this guy was a villain. It all starts with the permissive liberal media. Though this does raise some interesting questions. Despite our assumption last episode, James Tucker has gone on the record to state this comic was envisioned to take place before Justice League vs. The Fatal Five, meaning that we aren't too far from the tail end of JLU. So within the DCAU, what's causing the rise in homegrown American fascism? We never did see who became president instead of Lex Luthor. Was it Trump? Were we wrong all that time ago? Honestly though, this break from the real world might be a good thing because that means the citizens of the DCAU didn't have to be forced with this moral dilemma. As much as I dislike them both, obviously it was a more nuanced conversation than that gag permitted, and in hindsight, well, 
So sure, we were wrong, but I mean like in the sense of in-universe history, is it possible that the current DCAU president is in fact a very stable genius? I went from very successful businessman to top TV star to president of the United States on my first try. And speaking of fascist heads of state, how about that Vandal Savage, huh? Overman's world seems to share a lot in common with the world of the Savage Time, which I've previously suggested in an old episode of The Vanishing Point should theoretically still be around out there in the multiverse somewhere. So is this the same world? Well, it may be a bit too early to tell, but there are a few different points that suggest it could be just different enough to be somewhere else. For instance, Rather than the resistance from that episode, we now have the Freedom Fighters. Though these could theoretically coexist or even be related with one being a subgroup of the other. Similarly, the imagery of the Fourth Reich may serve to differentiate the two. Depending on when Hitler was put on ice in the Savage Time, it's possible that the Third Reich never came to be in that world. But if it did and Vandal kept the name while historically relevant, when and why would he change it to the Fourth Reich. Given that we never got any info on the Savage Time Superman, this Overman angle could theoretically fit. I suppose we'll just have to wait and see what the Bruce Wayne of this world is like before we're able to fully determine whether or not these worlds are the same or just similar. But man, if Bruce Wayne in this world turns out to be the same guy, that sure makes this bit from Jean just a little bit more sad. You understand that if we do change the past, you, this version of you, will never have existed. Nothing would make me happier. Circling back to Overman, how about these badass moments we got with strong women taking him on head to head? This back and forth between him and Wonder Woman? Fuck yes. He kind of reminds me of somebody here. You're not a champion. <laughs> Just as cheerleader. Wait, no, I didn't mean Skeletor. I was thinking about toxic online spaces whenever it's announced a woman is going to be the protagonist of a movie or TV show. But I suppose Skeletor is a decent enough stand-in for those types. Bring it, Skeletor. For real, though, if you haven't watched Masters of the Universe Revelations yet, do it. Eric Carrasco and Tim Sheridan both wrote for the show, and I know y'all love their work. Back on topic, the other instance of women badassery comes from Lois Lane as she blasts Overman with a kryptonite gun. Though, as cool as this moment was, I've got some questions. Obviously, Superman's gone rogue in the DCAU before. We see it during his show's finale when he's brainwashed by Darkseid, and concerns come up that it may happen again once confronted with the existence of the Justice Lords. So, how long has Lois had this weapon? And who built it. You'd think perhaps Emil Hamilton, but after he got tied into Cadmus, I doubt he'd be too enthused to build a kryptonite gun and not be able to use it himself. Maybe it was Batman who built it, as suggested by Lawrence on our Discord server, but if that were the case, it probably would have helped to have another one of these handy when Superman went rogue again in Batman Beyond. I just need to know where this came from and when, but since I likely won't get those answers in the next two seconds, I think it's time to throw this one back over to James. Other slash miscellaneous. <laughs> so Superman's first trip to a YouTube comment section went about as well as you'd expect. DCAU review, everybody. Of course, our comment section is nothing like that. The Australia box is a magical place, or was that Tahiti? This Brainiac design looks like it walked right out of Samurai Jack, and the Kirby Crackle vape juice leakage looks a decent amount like Hela's portals in Thor Ragnarok, and I love both of these things. Amrit Jessawala, the guys Jean takes in India, doesn't seem to be any particular real life person, but Eric, if also last name Jessawala, was real, a disciple of the Indian spiritual master Meher Baba, and who died in August of 2001. No idea if this is supposed to be the same person in this comic, but I don't believe in coincidence. Showing literal swastikas is also definitely something they couldn't have done on 90s kids TV, but it adds so much palpable real 
realism to this Nazi vandal savage world. We also see other Nazi symbolism in this issue, like the Reichsadler, or Imperial Eagle, which was also seen throughout the Savage Time. Pardon my horrible German. You'd think 20 years of listening to Rammstein would help me. A statue depicting the swastika inside a cogwheel symbol of the German labor front, and while not explicitly Nazi related, a statue of Germania, the personification of the German nation. Superman versus Nazis, or a version of Superman being a Nazi, is always a pretty intriguing choice, considering Superman was created by a couple of Jewish guys and is essentially Space Moses when you think about it. The men in red armbands that Overman is seen standing over may not be any specific reference, but could be an allusion to the Russian Red Army, who often wore red armbands during the Russian Civil War. Or they're just other Nazis for sparring and training or something, since Vandal Savage also wears a red armband. On a similar wavelength, Overman uses the term ineffectual when referring to the Justice League's pointless attempts to stop him. Ineffectual essentially means the same thing as ineffective, but is often used in context with power, like an ineffectual ruler or an ineffectual campaign. See, I don't do jokes anymore, I just teach you about language and history. I'm a dad now, strap in. But here's something zany! Batman trying to steal Blue Beetle's boot? <laughs> I guess Overman's Nazi pals aren't the only bootlickers around here. Wait a second! Is Blue Beetle one of the two Justice League member statues we couldn't identify in the Fatal Five movie? The details we can see do match up. Was Blue Beetle Blue Bud in our Pokey Rap too? Has he been here the whole time? And finally, Flash is on the cover, but he's not in the issue. This is Nightwing syndrome. Comment below if you think they're just both off fighting Mr. Freeze or something. Scoreboard! If you caught our last Adventures Continue breakdown, then you knew this segment was a coming. Here we're gonna take stuff that we predicted in previous breakdown videos and award or detract points from ourselves based on how terrible of a guess that we made. And honestly, I, I don't know <laughs> what to do for this one. I had guessed that Overman would be the Superman from Brave New Metropolis, but he's not. He just has notably the same symbol. So maybe this is a parallel time line of that universe? I, uh... And then I'd also guess that we would see more of Ethan Beaver's Instagram sketches in later issues, and we still might, but the only one close to anything this issue is this one of Wonder Woman standing there, and it's not even really the same pose, so maybe both of these can get like a 0.5 or something? We've got one point on the board, baby! What do we win at the end of all this? Maybe if we pass 10 points on both comics, we... Do a Zeta Project video? Guess I gotta start purposely guessing wrong sh Was this still recording? CONCLUSION! I love this comic. This thing is crazy! The art is gorgeous, the writing is beautiful, it feels like the show... Ah, I'm probably gonna say that same kind of thing every video. <laughs> Lois calling Superman Cal is an interesting evolution in their relationship. I don't think she's ever called him anything but Superman before. Our guess around these parts is that we'll get clarification of their relationship by the end of this series. With an alternate universe Superman and his own dead Lois, and our Lois coming so close to death herself, there's no way that Superman, the man of tomorrow, is not gonna realize that tomorrow's not guaranteed. Proposal on Jupiter incoming! One could assume this entire comic is being told as a story to someone. Every issue has been narrated so far, and with seven issues, we're betting it'll be one Justice League founding member per issue. Maybe the last two will be Green Lantern and then Hawkgirl, both because of Hawkgirl's proximity to Amazo, and to tie up loose ends with the John and Shiera relationship. Proposal on Jupiter incoming! Man, this issue went woke. Can't wait to see how broke they get. That's what the cracked mirror is referring to, right? The whole idea of the Savage Time timeline potentially still existing as its own world is very similar to what's happened with the Flashpoint world over the last few years. And if that's any indication, maybe we will get Thomas Wayne Batman in this comic instead of BTAC. As far as we know, there's not any production overlap between the two series, but anything's possible. Maybe in the Batman or Flash narrated issues. Only time will tell. And with that, I bid you fine folks adieu. Keep putting foreign language words in the scripts. This was a very fun and very packed issue. And if it's this early on, I cannot wait to see where this is going. I'm genuinely looking forward to these new DCAU comics every month, and you should be too. Make sure you're out there supporting these fantastic artists and writers by picking up copies along the way. Don't just wait until the trade paperback comes out when it's all over. Am I guilt tripping you into making sure you're doing all you can? as a DCAU fan? 
Maybe. But if it's not working, then consider throwing us your pocket change instead or in addition over at patreon.com slash DCAU Watchtower. We got a ton of cool stuff going on over there all the time, honey. Like early access to videos, monthly Zoom calls with us data buds, and just a bunch of other stuff, okay? I don't ever have time to say it all. It's cool though. We will see you next week for our BTAC season two number three breakdown video. And we'll see you all the time if you hit the subscribe button and turn Turn on notifications. YouTube really sucks at telling you when people post new videos. So don't rely on the recommendation robots. Click the button so that your phone buzzes every time new Watchtower database content comes fresh out the oven. Goodbye.